Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very beautiful Canadian actress that I grew up watching on the Wonder Years, Wendell Meldrum. You may remember her, she was Kevin Arnold's teacher who he had a crush on, Mrs. White. And I'm having her on the show today to talk about that show. Um, she was in lots of good stuff in the 80s. She had a recurring role on Knott's Landing. She was in movies like K-9 and Why Me. And uh, she had a role in A Mighty Wind. And she was the low talker on Seinfeld. And I can't wait to have her on today. It's going to be a really good show. This has been a long time coming. And I can't wait. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Wendell Meldrum. Hello? Hello, Tommy. How are you? Very well. How are you? I am just spectacular. It's such, oh. an, such an honor to be talking to the low talker. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I'll speak up. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, thanks for your interest. My pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, did you fall in love with acting early on? Yes, I was always a great pretender. I loved to play. I loved to. Uh, I loved stories. I loved to be part of a story. I loved to tell stories and make people laugh and. But, I, you know, in, in sort of an introverted, fantastical way, as opposed to being an extrovert, I wasn't at all. I, I like the idea of being invisible and a different person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did uh, school plays and community theater and all that growing up? Um, well, I was a dancer and a gymnast growing up. And I went to the BAMP School of Fine Arts for Drama when I was 16. And uh, that really sort of got me going and I was a contemporary dancer, a modern dancer, so a lot of it was very story driven and and uh, I was in a dance company that was sort of very um, theatrical and and uh, yeah, I preferred I preferred the stage. Mm -hmm. You did uh, tap and ballet and all that? Uh, well, mo more modern dance. Uh, ballet and modern dance, so, and I eventually ended up at Toronto Dance Theatre at the at the Martha Graham School of Dance, which people out west don't really know it, but she's a very, very famous uh, uh, dancer, out, out, mostly out east, I guess. Nice. You were, you were born in Italy, but raised in Canada. No, I don't know why that got there. On the uh, someone put it up there, and it's very hard to change information. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, I wasn't. I was born in Canada. I'm a Canadian. Yeah, for some reason they said you were born in Italy. <laughs> I know. Wow. I, I've, I've interviewed a lot of Canadians. They are the nicest people and the most free-spirited people I've ever met in my life. Oh, well, that's sweet of you to say that. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. They, they got no shame when it comes to their sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. So after high school, did you study acting? Um, I didn't study acting. I, I, I went to dance, and then I started working in the theater. Someone literally saw me on the street and said, you know, she'd be great to <clears throat> play. And, and, and she said, oh, I know, that's a friend of my girlfriend's. I'll, I'll hook you up. And I started working in the theater, and I started making more money than when I was dancing. So I... I uh, I ended up uh, switching to the theater from dance, and so I didn't. I don't have any formal training. I've studied, but not in a formal situation. And then uh, you came to LA. I went to Toronto, New York, LA. So I, uh, I had a taste of all this, all those cities. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite of the three? I like Los Angeles the best. You know, when you're living somewhere, you love it, but then you leave because you're burnt out or it burns you out or you're drawn 
on someplace else, and you know, you kind of gotta love where you, where you live. Mm, yeah, uh, L.A. back in those days was radically, radically different than it is now. <laughs> yeah, so is New York. You know, things have really changed, huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's a cultural, you know, it's a um, shift. <laughs> yes. It's not quite a flowering, but it is a shift. <laughs> yeah. So your first movie was Vamping with Patrick Duffy. Oh, my God. A thousand years ago. We shot that in Buffalo. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I haven't even thought about that in a long time. But, uh, yeah, that was my first actual film with, you know, SAG film. I'd done other things before, student films and that kind of thing and non-union, but. That was my first official, official film. Yeah, I had to look this movie up because when I hear the name Vamping, it sounds like a, a, a vampire movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's in the jazz world, it, it means kind of like uh, improvising. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a musical drama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it like working with Patrick Duffy? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, he was a gentleman, you know, I mean, he was professional, and I think he was excited to be doing something, sort of an indie movie, uh, after doing his sort of network show, so he was really interested in playing the character, and he worked hard at it, and, you know, it was a great creative stretch for him, and I think he worked really hard. Yeah, I think he's a very underrated actor. Ah, yeah, and he's a good he's a good guy. He's a real actor, you know. Like he really gets in there and you know wrestles with the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's he's great in everything I've seen him in. You did an episode of Punky Brewster. Oh mon dieu! I did with uh, one of the Bee Gees. Andy Gibb. Andy Gibb, yeah. Andy was really struggling at the time, and his parents would come. And uh, sit, sit there through all the rehearsals, so that uh, you know he just needed he needed people to be with him at all times when, during that show. And he was, uh, you know, and you could see this loving family showing up and and uh, wanting the best for their son. You know, it was a very, yeah. in a way, touching and sweet thing to see. But obviously fraught with a lot of concern for by everyone. Yeah, so so Soleil Moon Fry, she must have been just in awe of him. Uh, I don't think she knew. She was a very young person. She was a very young girl at the time. I remember that when she got all frazzled and but she still had to work, her mother would put a cappuccino in a baby bottle and hold her and give it to her so that she would calm down and get lifted at the same time and sort of be <laughs> nourished and go back into this little rest place because she's treated as an adult and she can't go nap for two hours, you know? Yeah. Like she actually needed to do. So that was a little trick that the mom did to, to help her keep adult hours. Wow. Those, yeah. those stage mothers. <laughs> yeah, I you know I don't know what, what happened with her or anything, but uh, whether she went to, what she went on to do, I don't know. I know I, I know she's got kids now, and she's she's still out there. I think she does like autograph signings and stuff every now and then. Sure. But yeah. It's a hard thing to be a child. I think actor. Oh yeah, I was talking about that with a guest yesterday who was a child actor and. You know, some of them, you know, get lucky and they, they grow up to be like Kurt Russell or Ron Howard. And then others, you know, they grow up to be like, you know, who, you know, Bobby Driscoll or, or somebody like that. I mean, it's it's a really weird thing. Yes, it is. It's, it's hard to know, but usually it, you know, you're right. It's very rare for them to go on and and, and carry on like that, and, you know, successfully. Mm hmm. You had a uh, recurring role on Knots Landing? I did, where I had my first screen kiss, where I ended up actually accidentally kissing my own hand. <laughs> and you, if you go to the episode, it's actually there. And they, they were 
going into golden time, which is after 12 hours, and it was a really big day and a big set, and there was, it would be very expensive. They were not going to go into gold that day. So they said, okay, let's rehearse this, let's block it out, let's get the camera here, we'll block it out, we'll shoot it in one, and, and then that's it. That's all we've got time for. We've got one take. So, you know, I come in all sort of sultry, surprising him, and, and we had our first screen kiss, and we both went in the same direction, because we'd never actually kissed before. And then I, I come around on the bed, and I lay down on his chest, and I had my hands folded underneath me, and we're having a, a quiet, sultry conversation. And then I just instinctively, I, you know, as if I was kissing his chest, I, <laughs> I kissed my own hand, and I went, I just kissed my own hand. In my head, I'm going, oh my God, those were my lips meeting my hand, not his chest. <laughs> and he didn't have time to redo it, so that's actually there. Oh my God. And who was it you kissed? Doug Sheehan. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alec Baldwin was on the show, which is crazy because, you know, he's had such a huge movie career that, yes. you know, you forget that he was on Knott's Landing. Right. Uh, I remember running into him at uh, a neighborhood uh, coffee shop a few years ago, and he remembered me. He said, because we all used to make fun of your name. We always said, uh, like Jerry Lewis would say it, Wendell Meldrum. <laughs> Really, Jerry Lewis did that? <laughs> no, they, they, would, they would say my name in different ways or something. They were, he said, we used to make fun of you. Oh. <laughs> was he as, as nuts then as he is now? Um, I think he's an intense person with, you know, big ideas and feelings. He, he didn't seem, he just seemed like a, an actor who was really into what he was doing. So An artist? Yeah, just really committed and kind of on fire and, you know, he didn't seem, I don't know, that's all I know, I know him as a, you know, professional and, uh, you know, a bit of a, you know, card, I guess, making people laugh and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that, that he likes to, to play practical jokes or something like that on the set. Yeah, I mean, he was, he makes people laugh, he's a funny guy. Mm -hmm. He's a very funny guy. You know, he does Trump on Saturday Night Live. Right. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> William Devane's a good actor. Was he good to work with? Uh, I don't know. I, I uh, don't think I had many scenes with him. And he was, you know, they were, they were already in it for a few years. So they all had their millions. And they all kind of showed up and were very professional and did their thing. And were very committed to doing their thing. And what their characters were doing and how they were perceived, but they were uh, they were very uber professional because they were also business people managing all that money. I once saw him; he he plays polo, mm -hmm. and I for some reason was out at uh, hiking up there. And I ended up seeing him playing polo, but no, I didn't have any connection with him whatsoever. He was he was the big mucky muck. Yeah, I've heard that about about soap operas, both prime time and daytime. That um, you know, the guest stars they 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 are they're in their own little world, and then the big stars are in their own little world, and so they don't really uh, connect on the set. Yeah, I mean, uh, I did with Doug Sheehan as a lovely person, and comes from the theater, and he's very warm and personable, and that's who I most of my stuff with. And he was he was uh, you know a real person. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Did they write you out of the show? Uh, I don't remember what happened there. I, you know, it was my first TV gig, and I didn't even have a TV. So I I don't know what happened. And I, I was working, I think, pretty steadily then, and it wasn't uh, something that I even knew that I should want to be on. Or Maybe kissing my own hand is, is a seal of... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, it was a good payday while it lasted, at least. Yeah, but you know, you're not getting that money that they're getting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then um, you you were on Paul Provenza's short-lived series, Pursuit of Happiness. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was uh, 
I was Michael Whitehorn, who is a really lovely fellow and a good writer. And, uh, yeah, I loved that character. It was a good character. And uh, I actually got a lot of press for it, which I didn't realize. I just had a baby at the time. And mm-hmm. Johnny Carson called me and, you know, I met with Doc Severson. And I didn't watch the show. I didn't know. It was never my dream to be on Johnny Carson, or you know, I don't, I don't really know. And, he, and, and I found out. He said, find some funny stories, some interesting stories, and come back, to, and we'll choose some funny stories to, to tell Johnny. I just thought, well, you know, I'm on a series. I'm I have a little baby, and I guess I just wasn't interested in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious! I don't even remember this show. Why did it get canceled so quickly? I don't. I don't know that. You know, they, they really protect. Usually, actors are really protected. You could feel that things were funky, you know, as we were moving through. But they try to keep your spirits up because they just want you to just have a ball and, and do a good show. They don't want you to be worried about whether the network is behind it or whatever. So we just didn't know until the end, and I, I still don't know what happened there. It probably could have been, you know, up against another hit show or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, I think usually you don't really know. They don't tell us the truth. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like working with Judy Aronson? Uh, she was very sweet. She's a lovely girl. Um, she was just very sweet. I don't really... Do you know Judy? Uh, I've been trying to get her on the show for like a year now, but uh, it might happen soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know she's off with Facebook friends. And mm-hmm. I think she's she went into the Pilates world and has a studio and just sold her studio. So she's, you know, been hardworking and smart and, you know, mm-hmm. carrying on. And yet, uh the legendary Brian Keith. Oh, uh, Brian, he was, he was a real, he was a real crusty guy. <laughs> and he said, everything's bullshit. He said, Houston, you know, John Houston used to just call me up and say, Brian, I have, a, I have part for you. You want to do it? Uh, I'd say, yeah, I want to do it. And that was it. There was no agents and casting people and managers. He said, they're all leeches. He was furious when someone would come on or he'd have to do something with the publicity thing or he just hated it. Mm-hmm. And he said, I was, the, I was the happiest person he'd ever met who wasn't a fool. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah, it was sweet because we've, we had many conversations and, and uh, he was crusty, but he, you know, I, I remember asking how many children he had and I think he said, I have four ones in heaven. Oh. And he had a little boy, and so you know what the tenderness of his heart that he carried around with every breath. And he had a little boy who drowned, and I think, you know, that never left him. I think he really uh, was profoundly wounded by that. Yeah, you know, his his suicide was bizarre because, you know, the guy had a 50-plus year history in the acting business and then you know that happens you know i mean it's 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 unlog- unlogical unless he had yeah. you know a pre-existing illness you know yes. and i thought you know I, when i heard about it i thought he's he's going to be with his little boy you know like oh it, it, uh, he was uh he was a great soul and i think that's what you see when you see him you see this great soul Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. in this sort of wonderful, crusty guy. Yeah, under underneath the the, the persona of the Kamunjan that he always played. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. He had a big heart. Oh, that's great. The, the the role that I remember you in most from from an early age that I fell in love with you in was Mrs. White on The Wonder Years. Yes, Miss White, Mrs. Heimer. Yes, Miss White, Mrs. Heimer, that's right. <laughs> that was just such a magical time. 
I was working on uh, Pursuit of Happiness, and it was all just kind of a team effort because Michael Whitehorn, who was the creator of Pursuit of Happiness, was very close with Carol and Neil. Mm -hmm. They were the creators of Wonder Years, and they were just starting out with their show. They had no idea what they had. And so they just asked me to play the part of Miss White. Mm -hmm. And originally I had this really sort of sharp beehive and this crazy outfit. And and uh, and it was a very difficult, uh, it was a wonderful first year. And then uh, at the, the night of the Emmys, Carol had given birth to her baby and her baby did not thrive and, and, and passed several days later. And... It was just a, such a time of, of deep pathos there. Yeah. And and, uh, and yet, here is this wonderful, wonderful, heartfelt, just magical show. It was. You know, I've been mean, for five years that it was on. I just looked forward to watching it week after week because you know this was this was you know my parents' a parents' era of sure. you know growing up in the late sixties, early seventies. And, you know, all the stuff that they, they, they told me, I, say, I saw it on the show, and they confirmed that that kind of stuff was real. Right. Right, yeah. I mean, it really was something. And just, it was cast so beautifully, and, and uh, you know, uh, Kevin, you know, was just such a, uh, a magnificent, uh, uh, you know, cornerstone in that, in that ensemble. Yeah, I, I remember that episode when Miss White drives Kevin home and he's trying to build up the courage to tell her how he feels and he tells her she's pretty and she thinks that uh, he's using that to cover up something that he's too scared to tell her. <laughs> right, right. And it's, you know, they really made that real, you know, and the, all the feelings that a little boy really does have. Yeah. You know, heartfelt feelings and, and you know, bigger than than life feelings for a little guy. It was really, really well done. Yeah, and I also like, you know, Miss White always, like, you know, did that head tilting every time Kevin right. gave her the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and he just waits for it. Oh, here it comes. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's very good. The or, Martin Luther King episode is, is really one of my favorite experiences. It was. Oh, the, 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 when you're when you're crying, that just breaks my heart. Yeah. In that episode. Yeah, and he catches me being a human, and you know he has a human response, and uh, it was beautiful, beautifully done. Beautiful, yeah, and, or the pregnancy one. Oh yeah, when he's driving me to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a really good one. Yeah, it was it was a, a really good show. And we used to sit around, um, Kevin and mm -hmm. I used to sit around in the car, and we were in the car quite often, and we'd sing Motown songs. He knew every Motown from Chicago, right? So he knows every Motown song. And because of my era, I know every Motown song. Yeah. So we'd sit around in the car singing Motown as we waited for, you know, this is their camera setup. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. You had a, a little role in uh, K-9 as a pretty girl with a dog. Oh, yeah, with Jim Belushi. Yeah. That was out in the Coronado Hotel. And, you know, I'm just a day player. I come on and, you know, lay it down. And, and uh, Jim Belushi had a fit that day. And mm -hmm. he, I guess, what I remember, I don't know if this is exactly true, is that someone cut the camera too early and he had something he was improvising that he wanted on camera. Yeah. And he had a ferocious meltdown. I'd never seen anything like it at that point. Um, and uh, I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm a guest there. I just, and, and people were, you know, hurt feelings and horrified for their crew member that, it really got ripped into asshole. <laughs> so uh, that was my experience there. Oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you you have to roll with it, and you know, sometimes people when they work, you know, we're really tight, we're really intimate. It is a really 
family feeling, kind of, where all your stuff is out there. And, you know, I don't even really like to tell that story, except, you know, it's something that happened. And, yeah. you know, I hope the guy didn't get fired. I don't even know. But, you know, people are on edge. And, and people are, you know, your insecurities come out in all sorts of different ways. And you have to kind of just roll with it because you still have to work. And it's not your job to, you know, police them. Mm -hmm. So people can express their vulnerability and fears in all sorts of different ways. Yeah, I heard I heard Cheech Marin say in an interview he almost played that role. Oh, is that right? Yeah, um, he did the movie Born in East LA for Universal, and they right? it got such a good response. They said, you know, we we, we want you to do movies uh, for us. We want you to to be a part of the Universal family. And the first movie they offered him after that was K Nine, and he turned it down. And so then the deal expired after that. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, that. That would have been something to see Cheech yeah. and that dog. That would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big Cheech and Chong fan. Yeah, he would have been wonderful. Yeah. Any memories of making Why Me? Why Me was actually really fantastic. I got to play an Armenian chip woman. And it was Christopher Lloyd, Christopher Lambert... And the woman, Kim Christ, is that? Anyway, it was, uh, I had a lot of fun. I, I got to really play, you know, I had a motorcycle. I, they trained me, at, they gave me a class at the DMV because I was supposed to be this hotshot motorcycle rider, and they had me doing wheelies and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I go down to the DMV, and uh, everyone has to say their name, just, to, you know, a little bit why you want to ride and stuff, and... I hear a guy go, I'm Stuart McGregor, who is Adamant. I don't know if you know that. I love, yeah, I love Adamant. And he had a, a, he had a 57 Triumph, completely restored, and all the gear, and he didn't know how to ride. (laughs) We were out there riding Honda 350s, and, uh... We were the only two that didn't get to take a break because we were such shitty riders. And he'd say, okay, everybody take a break. You two, keep going around. So needless to say, uh, when I came to do, I mean, obviously someone was going to do the big wheelie stunt, but all it ended up being was they just sort of pushed me into the scene on the, on a, uh, on, on the Harley. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But it was really, really fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Kim Greist is the name you were... Yes, there it is. Yeah. God, she she disappeared. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe she's doing theater somewhere. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Was, was Christopher Lloyd very shy and quiet like he usually is? Yes, but very attentive. You really felt that he he was... His eyes are everywhere. You know, you really, you really feel he had... Uh, sort of a lot going on. He didn't seem shy to me. He just seemed like he was a, he was just watching and, you know. Mm-hmm. I saw him at my very first Comic Con, and I, I I knew how tall he was, but he was just towering in person. Oh uh, yeah, he's he's, uh, he's 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 a bit of a spectacular man, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. And I'm and I'm six three, but he was towering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a tall one. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get cast as the low talker on Seinfeld? You know, I was really busy that summer. I I remember I was off to do Sawbusters, mm-hmm. movie Sawbusters, uh, with Chris Christopherson, directed by um, Eugene Levy, and mm-hmm. I got a call and said they can't find anyone for this part, would you just dip in? I lived like, you know, a few blocks away from CBS Radford. I said, yeah. So I went in, and it's a tiny little room. You're practically knees touching everyone, and Jerry was there, and, you know, Larry David, and a bunch of people, and, you know, Mark Hirschfeld, the passing person. And originally, I read it, and I just kind of, you know, as if she was someone who kind of chewed on her hair a little bit. And then Larry said, oh, just do it without the hair. And 
where there was mumbling for myself, I'd written a little script in there so mm-hmm. that I was really committed to the words, even though you couldn't hear them. I was really like into them, right? So I, I wrote out things that I was, I wanted to say. So it wasn't just mumbling; it was actually a script. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I was really invested in it, and so you'd see someone really invested in it, and so when they look at you like, "Oh my God, that was exciting for me," or something, you're going, it makes it worse, right? Because right. you don't want to ask them again because you know the person was animated about it, I guess. So, uh, and then that was it. And then I just did that. And, uh, and, uh, they were one, they were really great to work with. They had a really great, great schedule worked out and they're really professional. And I found all of them very, uh, approachable and, yeah. and, uh, warm and easy, easy to work with. Yeah. Everyone I've, I've talked to that was on the show, they've all told me, they don't know how anyone got any work done because they were laughing all day. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a really good set. Very super professional. I'm sure they saw the irony, though, the, the fact that you you already have a low, sexy voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, I don't know if they even, you know, they, I think they were desperate. I think that, you know, I, I went in because I was leaving shortly, so I don't think I was going up for stuff, and so they just popped me in at the last minute. So, so I think I was just someone who my agents kind of said, "Well, you know, try Wendell." Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. You you played a, a witch in a mighty wind. Oh my God! Well, <laughs> yeah, I really got that because Jane Lynch is a friend of mine, and she just said, you know, she was in the witch's thing, and she said. She she got to choose. I think she just said, you know, choose yourself a witch or two. And I think she chose. She just asked me if you wanna you wanna be a witch. So it was really just you know a day going in there and and uh, with a friend really. Uh, Jane Lynch is so good. Yeah, and she's a really good person too. Yeah, and Christo- uh, Christo- Christopher Guest. Oh my God, just that guy is just a genius. And he's very, um, you know, with me anyway, because, you know, I, I'm just there for, you know, half a day or something. You know, he was just very quiet but clear, and you could see that he was clocking everything and and uh, getting what he wanted, and, and uh, that's kind of what you want. Yeah, I mean, it takes a real special gift to make the kind of movies he does that, you know, they're... You know, the idea is there, but everyone mixes it up as they go along. Yes. And I mean, I think he holds that pretty tightly, you know, but, you yeah. know, come on, those people are just masters at, at improv, and and they're wonderful. Yeah, I, I like how, you know, the, 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 the last 20 years or so that he's been doing movies like Best in Show and A Mighty Wind and this one he did a couple of years ago, Mascots. He just takes the, the most mundane thing that you would never really think about and just turn it into something hilarious and yeah. thought-provoking. Yeah, with, it's his eye, right? His vision sees really uh, expansively into those little things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how did um, your podcast, The Last One, come about? Um, it's considered to be a woman on planet Earth, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I've been working with this sort of, uh, it's, it's sort of a, creating a philosophy or a, a, a template of, of truth that we can all agree upon. So I've got a, fe- a feature that I made called Cool But Necessary, and I've got a book, and I've got a blog, and I've uh, got a podcast, and I've got a short film. So it's all part of this expanding idea, you know, to get people out of, so the absurdity that we're living and into what actually we are, actually what we are living, you know, because we're, we're living, uh, culture is such a distortion for how, how we are living and all the ideas come mashed up together and we come against one another. And it's really not the truth of it. The truth of it is that I do this little, in my little film, it's called Pat's Big Question. And this question is, what am I? And it's like what we are is more important than who we are, because what we are is all the same. We all come out of a woman's body. We all have homeostasis, which is 
how the body sets itself, which is our greatest authority. And we get that from our mother and that and from nature, obviously. But it's, it's we all rule at 98.6. We, we heal when we, when we cut. Otherwise, you know, we'd be jam if we went into surgery. And it's this ability for the brain to keep all the pH and all of the, the cellular symphony inside of us alive mm-hmm. and balanced, that is our physical and mental health. And that is the greatest authority over us, not the government or, the, or some person that you think. And that we all have, we all share consciousness, we all have, we all have uh, the same needs, we all need water, we need good food, we need clean air, we need a, a community, we need a place to, to, to be, to, to rest, uh, we need, uh, you know, to, so these things are what we have in common. You can take a child from halfway around the world mm-hmm. and raise it, uh, you know, completely in a different culture and it's completely fine. We can get, uh, yo, you want a kidney? We've got a kidney from somewhere uh, all the way across the world. Well, it's going to work. Bring it. You know, we can transfer organs to one another. And we are so much the same. And yet, ideas which change throughout our lifetime. You can be born into a, uh, you know, a Baptist family. You become an atheist. You can become a Buddhist. You can be, you know, all life long you can change your ideas of what you believe and who you are or what your political affiliation is or what your ideas are about the world grow and change as you grow and change. Ideas are changeable, yet this is what we fight over. This is our conflict when we should be grounded on what we are because that is profoundly stable, profoundly the same. It is our greatest constant. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I, was, I listened to a couple episodes. The one that I found profoundly moving was the genitals one. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the biggest, we are led around by our genitals, and the body doesn't think they're that important. So uh, you can function without your genitals. You can have a good life without them. You know, if you within your heart or your liver or your pancreas or your, you know, things don't go so well. So, yet we have this this jacked up focus on genitals and what they do that I think is another great distortion when really it's, it's a holistic sense of the body and the organs that that we cannot live without. Mm-hmm. I... We, we feel like, oh, the genitals, the genitals. What's that person doing with their genitals? Well, that's a little creepy. Yeah. Just keep, tuck that in because that's none of your business. You're, anyway, you're, you're, anyway. you're telling people they need to stop masturbating? <laughs> no, I don't tell people they should stop masturbating, but I think that this, I think also sex can be a way to, to and we're, we're programmed in society to relieve anxiety. You know, it, mm-hmm. which is fine, relieve your anxiety, but I think that it can become a crutch and then you're caught in this loop of not dealing with your frustrations or your anxiety. I tell, obviously, sex is healthy and it's, it's uh, it should be had according to each one's individual uh, requirements alone or with someone else or, or as adults. Uh, but it is it is uh, a perversion that we, we put. It's so important in it. And sex sells this and sells that. I mean, we're just really uh, exhausting ourselves by putting all that pressure on being jacked up on sexual energy. Mm-hmm. You're telling people that they should, you know, choose their sexual out, sexuality wisely. That they well, should. It's, cre- it's, it's your creative center. Yes. And if you can channel that into creativity, if if you are frustrated or if you have more energy, you can. It, it's a great uh, way to be creative. There's nothing wrong with with um, expressing yourself sexually, but I think that when we get we're getting played by how we jack it up and we make it so important and we feel it's so important to to us, you know, how we appear sexually, are we sexy, is this, you know, the, the games that we're, that we're played to, and especially, you know, women, you see women just 
uh, using that card a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and then on the other side, you know, uh, with power, were all the other, those other dynamics. It both sides play. Mm -hmm. That's every, every every sentence you said in in that podcast just made me think. I stuff I never realized before. Oh wow! Well. Well, I am trying to create a a different portal that we can look through that is also true, and more it's probably more true. I'm going to say it's more true than what we're actually living. Like one of the great distortions we live that I don't put in the podcast is that our lives are made comfortable and easy because we wake up in the morning, you know, we have a place to live that has been built by someone. Who, and someone made the nails, and someone then hammered them in, and someone put in, you know, the piping that was made in a factory, and uh, all the tiny little things, the roads, the garbage, all the, the transportation that brings things to us to make our life seem like this heaven luxury. We don't have to go out and make things or, or fix our own sewers or, you know, we're living a, this life of luxury because of people who make money for, um, you know, they work a dollar per hour, or they work so much per hour. Mm -hmm. So those are laborers, and that's what our money should be, and that's how things, but we're, you, you're not allowed to talk about workers because you're talking about socialism. That's absurd. They affect our life, support the ease of our life, more so than any banker or hedge fund manager. So if you're a steward plug, you're not going to want them around. You know what I mean? Like, you need mm. someone who does the real things that make your life so easy. And we do not, we're not allowed to somehow focus on oh, you're a socialist or you're a communist if you talk about workers. Well, they're incredibly important to this life of luxury that we lead. All of the cars and the car parts and how they get transported around and the engineers and, I mean, we can order anything on the internet that we want and it comes to us. I mean, by people. Not mm -hmm. by people gaming the system by trying to figure out how to make more money, make money off of nothing and to play the stock market and to have hedge funds and to, you know, how can I make more money but not really do anything? There's labor out there for money per hour that are making your life better. And yet, we have this big con going on about that socialism. It's like, well, this is the truth of what we live. This is our true luxury. Mm -hmm. that, that is very well said, Wendell. That is, that is beautiful. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. So uh, you, you've never stopped working. You've kept working to this day. Um, so do you have any upcoming projects you want to plug? I don't. I have a, a series that I did in Canada called Less Than Kind, which um, was a wonderful series, and I don't, I think it's still on direct TV, but I won the Canadian Emmy for that, and uh, was nominated three times, and I won the Canadian Comedy Award for it, and uh, it's still out there somewhere, and, uh, you know, I have a couple of things possibly in the works, but nothing that I can say is been funded, so... So still out there, still doing it. Nice. I will keep an eye out for those projects. But um, I'm going uh, at the end here. I'm going to indulge your Canadian sense of humor. I got some jokes for you. <laughs> All right. Everybody knows the old nursery rhyme about the old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many kids, she didn't know what to do. What did her right leg say to her left leg? Nothing. They never met. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I have one for you. Okay. Um, when the world falls apart, everyone's be going to become a Canadian, and then we'll all be sorry. <laughs> That's a good one. That's cute, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, thank you, thank you so much for uh, you know showing an interest and taking me uh, a little walk through memory lane there. 
Oh, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to have you back on to talk some more. Sure. I mean, you know, let's keep in touch. And uh, thank you for the interest in my podcast and my work. It is important to me, and I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, Wendell. You were so delightful. And um, I will uh, keep in touch with you. And you have yourself a great rest of your day. All right, Tommy, you too. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Wendell Meldrum. Ain't she a sweetheart? Yes, she is. I like her an awful lot. Sweet lady, insightful lady, great stories, and fun. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.